Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective perspective. <laughs> and just like that, we're up and going. Wonderful. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's a girl that we work with named Marvelous, which I think is hilarious. Oh yeah, that 16 year old buster we just hired. Oh, she's 16. You didn't know that? No. Me either at first. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm <laughs> so, really happy you just some, said that. Somebody had to tell me, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I said something to her, and I shouldn't have said that." After uh-huh. I found out she was 16. Wow. Okay. Like, oh, yeah. Good to know. <laughs> she was definitely like, you know, you know, whenever you can kind of tell the girl's flirting with you first, yeah. she was kind of giving those signals, and I was like, eh. And then now that I know she's 16, it's like, eh. yeah, yeah. Nope. <laughs> it's like the Don't power up no button versus the power down button. Yeah, just turn it down to one or zero, actually. <laughs> yeah, let's go down back <laughs> to zero. Right. That's two years under 18. Yeah. I mean, if you wait two years. Who knows? Who knows? Right? She probably won't be there then. <laughs> she won't be around. It's only 24 months. That's, not, that's an easier way to look at it. I always want to like, give people my age in months from now on. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm 364 months old. And they're just like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, you're, uh, sure, you're old enough. <laughs> you just get like a day count every single day. You wake up. It's right. like, I'm 5,280 days old. Right. The, I guess people with OCD might want to keep track of their age by day or minute or hour. I mean, just take some math. You can figure it out. Exactly. That's all it takes. Well, I, you want to start off with the story about this shirt? Yes. Or what would you call this? What would you call this thing? It's like a, it's like a sequin blazer. Sequin blazer. It's pretty. I'd go with that. Sick. Yeah. Wait, what does sequin mean? It's the little like shiny things you can flip up and down. Okay. With your hand, yeah. Yeah, those are fun to, you know, you can put them up. I got a pillow with that on it. Maybe one thing indicates something about my what's going on in my head right now. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, one side's all messed up, one side looks good. So maybe, like, it's it's projecting your, your psyche onto yourself. Possibly. You never know. The balance between order and chaos in this world. It's like the yin and yang symbol. Yeah. The ones and the zeros. The binary of, of life. Du- exactly. Duality. Just duality in general. That's what I'm trying to represent. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Thank you. You're One welcome. side reflects the other. Soaks uh, in light. Uh, yeah, that absorbs. Absorbs. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Yes. All right. So the way I got this jacket, bla- or set queen blazer. Oh wow. Okay. So rewind back about a year and roughly five months ago. So it's like March of 2018. My roommates. There are four of us at the time. We three of us decide to re-sign on a lease for the following year, so we're, we have four people. One of them's leaving. We need to fill this one spot because we got a good thing going between the three of us, and we wanted to keep that going into the following year. Yeah, didn't have to move your shit out. That's ideal situation. So, this one dude moves out. We get a verbal commitment from somebody, and then two months later comes. Again, he gave us a verbal commitment for like two months. He backs out the day of. so we're And then we tell the landlord, and they're like, well, you have like a week to figure this out. Oh, shit. And we're like, oh, shit, we don't want to lose this house. And we're like all freaking out. We're texting every single person in our contacts. It's like, oh, maybe this person, maybe this person. Between the three of us, we all come up with two people, so two candidates to fill this spot. And we talk them over. I knew who both of them were. Mm-hmm. But they were pretty much like blank slates, like tabula rosa or whatever it's called, like Mm. blank slate to me. I didn't really know much about him, so I didn't have much of an opinion. One of my roommates was very outspoken about this one individual. He's like, man, he's a really cool guy. He's awesome. He would be a great addition. So we end up going with him. Mm -hmm. He lives at our place by himself over the summer with the three of us like gone back home living with our parents. Okay. So we're all living back in our hometowns. And this individual is living in our house. He has one dog and then buys another whenever he moves in. We're not allowed to have dogs on the lease, like, technically. And we're we're already having, like, like uh, Did you tell I don't know him how, that before he moved in? The landlord or? The, the guy that moved in. He can't have dogs. We, uh, he told, he said that one of our roommates said he could. Mm. But I, my understanding was he knew he wasn't able to. And we were all just, like, kind of looking the other way on it. Just, like, hoping for the best, almost. Right. So, the yeah, so he, he claims that one of our roommates told him, like, hey, man, you can't have this, but, like, it's fine. Like, 
like we, we'll let it slide or something like that. Yeah, as long as the landlord doesn't know, you're fine. Absolutely, like, that's kind of what we're all kind of going with. Mm. And uh, there's some com- miscommunication there. I can't necessarily fully remember what it was like at the time, but um, anyway, this guy lives at our at our house, the house we lived at for like that full year beforehand. And his dogs piss and shit all over our rooms. I return in the, uh, I return for the fall, so like that August, after like two months of him living there, he was clearly doing coke in my room, in my roommate's room. I think he fucked in my bed because I had these like boards that weren't like solidified by like a nail. They were just kind of like placed in there, and they were like three of them missing. Like they're not missing, but like falling over the place. Mm. And it, my bed was just kind of like. It looked like somebody was jumping on it or fucking. It was, like, pretty disheveled. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, so we're just like, what? what is going on? This is weird. And, like, my roommate's room is trash. And, like I said, I, I could see traces of coke, like, on my table. Like, these guys are going hard in my room. And it was not, like, going hard in, like, a... It was going hard in a very disrespectful way. Yeah, like not even cleaning up after themselves. And there was like. no need for them to be in our room. No, no, that whole, whole other house to fuck around in. Exactly. Literally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. So uh, that's great. Um, yeah, so we we return and, I mean, just returning back, it was like more red flags than any roommate I had before. And I'm like, okay. Mm. So this guy was good friends with Doriel Green Beckham, who was – do you know who that is? He was, like, the number one recruit coming out of – so he graduated high school in 2012, I believe. Mm-hmm. But he, going into college, he was the number one football recruit in the country as a wide receiver. Wow. I don't follow football at all, but, like, I have that memorized because it's relevant to the story. Yeah. So this guy's, like, the shit here in Springfield, Missouri. Like, huge big deal. And – he ends up going to Mizzou, short little short expert on excerpt on his career uh, or summary is that he goes to Mizzou. He ends up kicking a girl down the stairs, I believe, then goes to Oklahoma State. Then I don't think he finished school. I'm not positive about that, but he at some point he ends up on the Tennessee Titans and then the Philadelphia Eagles, and then he got kicked out of the NFL. Damn. And then so he would always be over at our place, and him and my roommate – we're, like, trapping out of our place. Like, definitely moving some weight. Damn. And we don't know how to confront the situation. We just said, we're, like, just keep it out of the house. We're, like, you can do what you want, man, but, like, keep it out of the house. That's all we ask. That rule got broken very quickly. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're that deep into that kind of coke use, you don't care what it says. You're yeah. just more about doing more coke. Exactly. That's what they focus on. And selling more coke. Well, cocaine is the only drug that actually creates pathways that only leads to doing more coke what do you mean by that like whenever you do a a psychoactive drug it creates new neuron pathways in your brain Uh, like marijuana will create more pathways in your emotional center which prolonged use expands your emotional center and reduces your creativity center Um, cocaine just creates more pathways to getting more cocaine it makes you want to do it more and makes you like thrive for it more Uh, is that why it's so much more addictive than a lot of in comparison to other drugs? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically equivalent with heroin about how addictive it is. Really? Yeah. Heroin just fucks you up on a whole other level. So like, it, it literally rewires your neurochemistry to be, like, to just start, like, craving it just, like, constantly. It can make an addict of, out of somebody who wasn't an addict before. Like, even without an addictive personality, uh-huh. it will create one. It, it will change your pathways enough to alter your personality, possibly permanently, if you, you know, do it enough. Wow. So, yeah. Cocaine's one hell of a drug. <laughs> As they say. As they say, yes, sir. That's hilarious. That's wild. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, he's they're trapping out of our place. He's he's um he every single day. Like every day that he was there, the dogs are pissing or shitting somewhere in the house. We had to go get him every single day, get him to clean it up. The problem never really like got reduced. Like it, it didn't really get better, like the entire semester. He would, he would leave his dogs in the room to go party with the Chiefs football team. He was also really good friends with Kareem Hunt, who was like the Chiefs running back at the time mm. and was apparently having a great season. But then he got kicked off because he like there's a video leaked by TMZ mm. around like November-ish of, I guess it would have been 2018, of him like kicking this girl in the face when like some night out partying. I might have heard about that for like some clickbait or just from sharing online about somebody doing something like that. Sounds Absolutely. Fami- sounds familiar. 
Do you do you know if by chance was like um, like a Chiefs player? I don't I don't even remember. It's like a vague like familiarity of a football player being kicked out by abusing somebody and being online. I feel like that could be anybody too. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. The dog fighting rings and all that. And yeah. You never know. There's tons of stuff that NFL players get into. Football's a weird sport like that. Like the oh. kind of people it creates. Right. Yeah. Like well, you're paid millions of dollars to play a sport and a lot of pressure on you. So sometimes people just blow off steam with drugs or women or whatever else they feel like using their copious amount of money on. In aggression. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Because I mean, you're you're encouraged to be aggressive as an NFL player. You're supposed to be out there and like just just plow over these other people and play for your team. Which I mean, sports kind of has that pack mentality sort of like this is my pack and that is our enemy pack we're supposed to dominate that pack we're supposed to be better which of course can connect can create like uh finacity is that the word for it? like fanatics basically like the crazy fans who will hurt other people because they support this team and you don't support this team just it, it kind of creates that pack mentality of aggression that that is so scary like it really is. There's a part of it that the competition's really cool, but I agree. Like, what we're talking about is, like, the point that it gets to be just absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And the, some people just can't handle the pressure, and they, they crack and abuse people and do drugs. And that's just – sounds like what this guy's path led to. Absolutely. really sad. Yeah, yeah. It, he, I mean, he went from NFL down to, like, trapping out of Springfield, Missouri. Like, I mean, like, big drug dealer of Springfield, Missouri, like – sad i don't know i don't know what he thinks of himself but i i mean i don't know i hope where he's at it's better than what it was here for him yeah i hope he's found something better for himself because he's a kid too it's not just him at this point like he's a kid on the line as well so yeah Yeah, once you have more than just your life in your hands you've got to take responsibility absolutely not be doing dealing on that level but yeah yeah, anyway he would he would leave his dogs like trapped in this room for like oh what was it I mean, up to, I'd say, two to five days at a time, but every single weekend he would leave them just locked up in his room. What about food and water? He would have a guy come by, but he was unreliable. He was unreliable. Like, he came, so there were some weekends he never came by. There was, like, a four-day weekend he came by once. Like Damn. That's a, animal abuse, man. Like, no, there was this girl that came over, and she's like, I'm calling animal abuse. This is a Good. problem. Good. And it, we just got used to it, and we're like, and we like saw it as a problem, but we never thought about animal abuse. Like, I, at least I didn't. Yeah, like I don't it, know if that was naive of me or what. But. It just it probably just didn't directly affect you, so it wasn't in your your sphere of awareness. Like you knew it was happening, but it just didn't it didn't hurt you. I would say, uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good um, hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah, and plus being in college and everything, you already had a lot of pressure and not a lot of time to yourself. So that's how it goes. Absolutely. Yeah. Focused on your own shit too, and we we kind of did shit for him. Like I get him food, but I didn't really take him out, and they would piss and shit all over his room every single weekend. And then that's sad. Yeah, yeah. I got I got three dogs and a cat. Technically, we haven't paid our pet deposit for the house. Mm-hmm. I mean, I moved in with my girlfriend and her mom, and they've been there for almost fourteen years now, and they've had those dogs since two thousand eight. So and it never been caught. No, no. And we've had, like, tech guys come by or maintenance guys come by to fix toilet and doors and stuff. And they never say anything because it's not their job to, you know, care about that. Right. As far as, I know, as far as I know, the landlords have never stopped by. Wow. So we've never paid the pet deposit. We're good. Probably never will. No. Ideally, at least. Ho- hopefully not. Fingers I mean, crossed. <laughs> <laughs> See, the Sequin jacket. Still need to know how, I, how you got that. Okay, so transition over like pretty much fast forward we finished that semester all those problems that were occurring uh we go back home to we're, we're all back in our hometowns he's still down in springfield and i guess he things got a little bit like heavier or something like that at, at some point in time i guess he was moving like more weight than he even was during the semester but at the very end of the semester there was like a there was construction going on right outside our house and that kind of segues into what i'm going to say but i didn't think too much of the construction why would you mm, right. but my roommate was like or somebody said to me they're like what the fuck did they really fix and so fast forward happy to birthday. Whoa. hello just sorry to interrupt real quick hi Lucy just wanted to say hi to david hi. that's it i, I need to do. Very rude. Not rude. how you doing lucy 
Lucy. 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 Thank you. I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm telling the story of how I got it, actually. Is it good one? I'd say so. It's a sad story. Well, I'm getting to that part. It's a it's a sad story so far. Spoiler alerts. He gets the jacket. Hey, Sam. Have a good night. All right, so fast forward to I think it was like December 12th, something like that. His girlfriend, because we weren't able to communicate with him directly, he would kind of just ghost us. And his, so his girlfriend's texting us, why are the dishes not done? You guys are slobs. You guys are – and we're like, what? We haven't been there like two weeks. Like, why is this our problem? Right. And so she's trying to, like, blame all these problems on us. And long story short, they're really – like, he was the cause of the dishes but wouldn't accept responsibility. So – I'm seeing a pattern here with this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot a lot of lack of responsibility, like a, a ton. But, uh, yeah, so fast forward. Or later that night, I so I'm, I'm in this group chat, and she's bitching at us. Why are the dishes not done? Why is this not done? Why is this so dirty? You guys are disgusting, blaming all of his problems on us. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, this is ridiculous. And I was doing jujitsu and boxing classes at the time, so I'm like, yo, I'm going to boxing class. Like, see you later, pretty much. I get out of that class and I I think I think I got a shower in and then like 20 minutes later calls just start pouring in from this person from this person from this person from this person and all these people don't know me like they're all I know them all from down here but I know them all from like different social ties I guess you'd say mm -hmm. so I'm like confused and I, I call one of them back and they're like Jordan why are there people standing outside your house with AK-47s? I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, these are like DEA agents or FBI agents or some form of police. And they are standing outside your house with like big guns. And I was like, what? Long story short, our house got raided by either the DEA, the FBI, or somebody related to that. They would like shoot flashbangs in through our windows. My roommate literally had like a a hole in his wall from one of the flashbangs and um all our windows got shattered it caused like eight thousand dollars in damage Damn. and long story short he moved out after that and he well he was he was arrested for like a day and then he got out and i think he he may or may not have charges pressed on him now i don't know but him and doriel green beckham they both were like doing their thing in our house and Got a lot of trouble. And then we were on TMZ for it because Doriel Green Beckham was involved in it, who's an ex NFL player. So our house was on TMZ for like a drug raid. That's and we're like, cool, but sad. What? Yeah, it's a crazy story, but like, it sucked to live through. Right? So, so how does the jacket come into play here? Okay, so the jacket comes into play because he left all of his shit in the room for the entire semester. Mm. And probably like after like two, three months, we're just like getting, in, like, at that point, we're like, fuck this guy. Like, like he, he sucks. Yeah, he's not coming and, back. Yeah, and he's not coming back, too. So he left all his shit in there. So I'm, I'm like, looking. I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm in there one day for whatever reason. I don't remember what it was. But I went in his room because it was kind of the untouched part of our house, as you probably could imagine. Yeah. And so I went in there, and I see this jacket. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take that jacket, and that will always be a story of Keenan. <laughs> right? So that's just your link to that, that time in your life. Exactly, yeah. It's pretty sick. It's a, it's a, how do you describe it again? It's a sequin blazer. A sequin blazer. It's very nice. Shiny sequin blazer. I'm almost, I'm almost jealous. <laughs> Just not as to how I got it. No. no <laughs> I do not want to experience that to acquire that jacket. Just buy it. Yeah, right, right. Right? Maybe find this at a thrift store or something. Yeah, six bucks. Boom. Working exactly. like a pimp. A disco ball pimp. Exactly. Boom. Disco ball pimp. That's, and like the, that's the perfect jacket to go like roller skating in, like at the at the roller rink. Get some pants that match. <laughs> mm. Be set. Or some checkered pants. Yeah, yeah. Like I can see like that going well. White checkered pants. You know, some white and black shoes, old dress shoes. This kind of has an '80s appeal to it. It kind of does, yeah. Like all the light shining off of it. You'd be a living disco ball. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's great. You got I vision. You got I the vision it. for this jacket. And you have the look. Oh, wow. Well, it means the world. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to you about, I've had this explained to me by you even, mm -hmm. and I've had this explained to me like multiple times, 
just in general, but I still don't understand what it is exactly. But what is mes- metaphysics? Metaphysics. That is like the, it's basically governing laws of the spiritual aspect of the universe in a way. Um, quantum mechanics and metaphysics are coming, slowly coming together as one single field. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, because quantum mechanics have shown that human consciousness can affect reality directly just by observing it. Um, the double slit experiment, I'll explain just in case viewers haven't seen, but kind of don't, don't know where it is. Um, basically, they have a wall and then a little slit that has two holes in it, and they would shoot light particles at this. They would shoot one single light particle yeah, at a time? One light particle at a time. And if they were just looking at the wall, it would have lines all the way across it, and it would act as a wave. It would cross through both the holes at the same time and go through it. So and it was five five lines? Is I that th- right? I think it's like five or seven. I'm pretty sure it was an odd number. And, yeah, it would act as a wave, and it would go across the entire back wall. And it's basically like probability. It, it didn't have a definite area of, of where it was supposed to go. But when they decided to try to view the two slits directly, it would only create two lines on the back wall, meaning that observing the event would change the outcome. So they repeated this back and forth. Wait, what was the difference between observing and not observing? If they weren't observing the two slits, it would act as a wave, and there would be multiple lines on the back wall. It would disperse outwards and have multiple probabilities. But if they were observing... It would only be one or the other slit, and it would create just two lines what? on the wall. So observing the white particle would change its behavior, not by interfering with it, but just by looking at it. So that Consistently. In, consistently, yes. That infers that human consciousness directly affects our physical world just by simple observation. If you think about it, an atom is 99.9% empty space. Uh-huh. Like if the nucleus of an atom was puffed up to the size of a speck of dust, the electrons flying around would be miles and miles and miles away. There would be so much empty space in an atom. And those links between the atoms are simply mag- are electromagnetic. So there's also space in between that. It's action at a distance. So it's mostly empty space, all of this. Mm-hmm. It's just like a, it's like, a, it's like a manifestation of energy. We're seeing what the atoms together are creating, the energy field it's creating. But back to describing metaphysics and quantum mechanics kind of at the same time. Metaphysics being the larger scale of quantum mechanics. There's multiple laws of, me- of metaphysics, or the law of one, or the law of infinite, or the law of abundance and prosperity. Um, but the biggest one that's known is called the law of attraction. There was a pretty popular documentary made about this called The Secret, which it had a whole book and a documentary on Netflix. It gained a lot of traction, um, even with like corporate companies. They would kind of mm-hmm. pass down seminars, be like, oh, if you guys practice uh, guided meditations or you do visualizations before you know, going to sleep or when you wake up, you'll begin to attract these things you desire. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, uh, you know, the big sensational stories was this guy had, I think it was like $100,000, just the, the word, $100,000 taped to his ceiling. And he would see it every single morning when he woke up and before he went to bed. And he would think on it and meditate on it. And I think after so long, he got some random bonus at work that was unrelated. And he just got $100,000. Literally hundred k. So, yeah, but it, it, the, the, the concept is that by thinking it, you start to take action to make these things happen, mm. and it attracts things. So it's as if your mind has a magnetic sort of interaction with the universe. When you have a thought, or you say something, or you have an emotion, it sort of sends out this magnetic signal, and it can attract things. Like people who always talk about being sick, or complain about being sick, tend to be sick more often. Those who I would talk agree about with success, that. yeah, those talk about success. Like even at work, people complain about the bad tips their tables constantly. Keep getting bad tips. Which I wanted to compliment you, by the way. This is like kind of off to the side, but I yeah. wanted to compliment you because my complaints. <laughs> this is paradox, right? But 
my complaints with the serving industry is how complaintive it is. Right. Like it's it's kind of toxic on some days of just like how constantly how constant people are just the amount of entitlement and the amount of complaining it's like i don't know it's it's you want everything but you don't want to do anything for it that's what the mm-hmm. service industry kind of thrives on but if it's busy we complain if it's slow we complain absolutely either way we're going to complain yeah. But it's it's about the money, which is always sad, because I mean we're just there to make a to make enough money to pay our bills, and get by, and come back and do it again. Yeah. But I mean, if you keep a good mindset, and you keep yourself in a positive like, you know, a positive personality, you always put on a positive personality, you will attract positivity. With that law of attraction, if you think it, you do it, you live it. And that's what the documentary and the book, The Secret, was kind of about. You you think on things, you meditate, and even you can, if you can, dream about it, and it will hopefully come to you. And it doesn't work a hundred percent of the time. It's not, you know, foolproof or perfect. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of variables that we don't understand. Which I mean, they've always said that magic is science we don't yet understand. And some people might think, oh, if you think about something and it pops up, it's magic. It's really just science we don't understand. Hence, I like that. Magic is science we don't understand. Hence, metaphysics. It's still a part of physics. It's just meta. It's it's part of the whole universe that we don't fully understand yet. I mean, that's. I like how you said that. Like you, you want to make actions towards that because I've seen the secret. The documentary came out in like oh three. Is that right? Yeah, a long time ago. And I really, ago. I really loved the concept. Like it was really inspiring. I remember it was. I, like post watching it, I was like, this is this is really interesting to me. This is really interesting. But it almost sounded a little too good to be true, and almost right. like a fantasy. But I don't, I don't think. I'm too open to the idea to just rule it out completely and be like, that's bullshit. Because I know a lot of people that are very hypercritical of it. Like, I've listened to podcasts where they're very critical of The Secret, and I've listened, like, I've talked to people about it. And they're very quick to judge and say it's bullshit. But I, I don't know if I would agree with that, but I think there needs some plan of action. And who knows if your thoughts aren't helping, if you're not reshifting your focus to whatever that goal may be. Well, it's kind of like the whole issue with the the power of prayer. People say, oh, if you pray and you think about something, it'll just happen. Well, if you pray, it does not guarantee to happen. But if they say if you meet the universe, or I'll I'll use the word universe instead of God. I don't like using the word God that often because it has kind of a religious, loaded definition to it. So the universe itself will meet meet you halfway if you take action. If you think about it, you visualize it and you take action towards that outcome, that solution, Mm. it may happen if it's favorable. But if you just sit back and pray, it can happen too. I mean, it's not guaranteed. It's not – it's a really big idea. That's that's probably why people attack it because it's a big idea that not everybody can just accept. It kind of falls in the same line with, like, prayer or meditations, or, or like the, the Buddhistic chants, or tribalistic, you know, rain dances. Rain dancing is a good example of the power of attraction. If you get a whole tribe of people doing a rain dance, and suddenly it starts raining, did it rain because it was already about to rain, or did it rain because they rain danced? You could speculate on that all day. All day long. But there have been studied group meditations um, in large cities that were focused on reducing crime rate and there was a consistent correlation between these group meditations and the reduction of crime rate. Really? Yeah, it would drop by 20 to 30 percent almost. Ooh. Excuse me. Almost every time. Not exactly every time. Sometimes it would go up, but more often it would at least slump. How sustainable was that? Like, if you were to, if this group meditation were to occur one time on a Wednesday, like how long after would the crime rate kind of stay lower? As far as I read into it and have have looked into it, it's it lasted for the day of, like within the time frame that it was happening, and possibly some time after. Um, but I don't know if that would last throughout the entire day and a half, two days, or three days. I think you'd have to have a group constantly meditating on it. 
or you could just have people stay in a good mindset constantly. You can do a living meditation, and people could always be meditating, which that's what Buddhists strive for is living meditation. It's continuing to be in a meditative state as they live. Almost implying like a higher elevated sense of consciousness yeah, while you're just being going throughout your daily routine? What you might call enlightenment or ascension. Nirvana. Something of, yeah, something of that sort. They just they strive for peace. When people think of meditation, they think of not thinking of anything, just having a totally blank mind. But that's not true. Meditation is thinking of nothing in particular. You'll have thoughts run through your mind no matter what. It's just not about you can't cling on to those thoughts. You can't just hang on to that thought and let it roll into other thoughts and continue that whine of the thoughts you're having. It's about just letting it go and letting other thoughts flow in and out, in and out, which Bruce Lee talked about this as well. You have to let yourself be like water. Let the energy flow through you. You can't just stop it and try to hold on to that river. You have to let it flow. And that's what meditation is, is letting your thoughts flow. So a lot of it almost goes back to, like, attachment. Yes. Like, the I, I'm, I don't want to throw any, uh, I don't want to clutter that word of attachment, but, like, almost the Buddhist interpretation of attachment. Mm-hmm. Of, of But, like, almost, like, mentally, like, cognitively, like, your thoughts going in and out of your consciousness mm-hmm. and holding on to those ideas, those concepts... How does that how does that tie in? Well, you have to try to like you can't like force thoughts, you can't force positive thoughts, but you have to look at maybe where those thoughts are coming from. Like get more you, aware. Yeah, aware of your thoughts. You have to be aware of where they're coming from and what caused them, either your previous experience or just that day's experience. If you're meditating and you start thinking, "Oh man, this sucks," or "Oh, I hate this per- this person," or "I want this to happen." You might try to think back, well, why do I want this to happen? Why do I hate that person? Why do I this or why do I that? You have to become aware of why you're trying to think that, what intention you have when you think that, and where that possible train of thought can lead if you follow through with action. You want to follow through with the positive things. Let go of the negative. Don't hold on to the positive, but try to follow through with it in your waking life. Meditation's about becoming well, not becoming one with yourself but more of discovering yourself discovering your thoughts and discovering where they come from and what you may want to do with them which dreams are important too they can also tie into that when you meditate before you go to sleep you tend to dream more often really yeah Medi- or do you just recall it more perhaps maybe it's both at the same time because when you're meditating you're lowering your brain waves and to where your subconscious can more easily communicate to your conscious self. Mm. And there, in between the conscious and subconscious is like your sub-self, your animal sub-self. It like kind of filters out what it doesn't want to get reach your conscious self, so only a handful of thoughts from the subconscious reach the conscious. So as you meditate and get deeper into meditation, you kind of thin out that, that filter and you become closer with your subconscious. And you can find more of why you think that way or more of what you really want. Because you can have all these crazy thoughts all day long and you hold on to one or another and you won't ever actually find what you're trying to do with these thoughts. So there's always an intention behind every thought. It's more about uh, just being a more, a better version of yourself. More self-aware. Yeah, definitely more, more self-aware. Almost like more self-aware, more intentional. Yes, it's almost, it, it, if you want to think about it this way, it's almost like becoming more human in like a really bizarre way. Because, I mean, what separates us from animals? Self-awareness. Mm-hmm. I mean. Thumbs. <laughs> thumbs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was funny. I was holding up one thumb already. There you go. Yeah, already halfway there. <laughs> but, I mean, like, I mean, obviously the, the neocortex as a whole, prefrontal cortex, like, these are going to be the things, but what does that really possess? Like conceptual thought, being like analytical reasoning, being able to think of hypothetical, I guess, not realities, but hypothetical scenarios playing out before we actually decide to take action in towards those. Because we're able to kind of like almost build mental avatars into like 
into something before we decide to dive into it ourselves. And sometimes you're able to reason that, that approach to something out before you actually give it a try yourself. Yeah, you kind of create your own little plan and try to take all the variables that you can into account into getting the solution you want, which again goes back to the law of, of uh, attraction. You're trying to attract that solution and you're trying to plan out your actions. Mm. And it, of course, begins with the thought, the intention to create that solution through action. Meditation is about finding that. You can use creative visualization with meditation to achieve those solutions. And the better you get at meditation, the better you'll get at attracting things. It's so let me, sorry, I, I catch you off. I would say it's all tied together. Interesting. Interesting. So let me riddle you this. So if you... The law of attraction, in theory, is going to. Oh, what would I say? If if the law of attraction, in theory, is going to some way interact with God, the universe, whatever you want to say, and then manifest whatever you desire. What if, without your own awareness to something, what you desire and what you're striving for, and what you're trying to attract, isn't necessarily good for you, but you're unaware of that. So then, as the Dalai Lama once said, like, sometimes not getting what you want is the greatest or most beautiful stroke of luck or something along those lines. So it, do you think that sometimes people are quick to rule the law of attraction as bullshit because they, they do all their proper, proper, like, techniques and they try to, like, pursue all the methods and then they fall short but maybe that's just a way of saying the universe knows something you don't and maybe you don't want you what you want some people will go into that like if they're gonna try try out the law of attraction like oh i want to get this car or this amount of money and sometimes they'll go into it with a selfish reason and if you go into it with a selfish reason you won't always get what you want there's no real there's no real so you can get that, and sometimes getting what you want isn't what you need. It might cause you pain. And if you think about it, everything is about growth. And if you have pain, it will cause you to think about what you did to get there, and that will cause you to grow. And in turn, if you are a critical thinker and look at the big picture, you'll realize that this selfishness is what's causing this pain. And if you mm. let go of the self and become selfless, you can attract things easier. Go into it with a positive intention without expecting anything in return. Taking tithes, and, uh, as an example, in, in like a church, you're like, oh, I've been told if I donate this money, I will receive tenfold. So I'm going to donate ten bucks, and I'm going to get a hundred bucks back because they want money. And that's selfish. But if the original uh, definition of tithing was giving ten percent of yourself to the community, such as volunteering or helping people cleaning up trash things like that then you were giving yourself and being selfless and therefore attracting things you might even know that you wanted but needed mm. and there would be less pain that way but i mean some people will still go into that with a selfish thought even subconsciously and that's where again meditation comes in is realizing more of what you actually want more of your subconscious self sometimes pain is needed Pain can be a catalyst for change, which, again, will lead you to growth. But not everybody's ready for growth. Sometimes it just takes time. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I've heard a quote along those lines of the answer to the pain is within the pain, and that, that kind of alludes to I like that. dive deeper into the pain. Mm -hmm. it actually, that came from somebody who had their – their, I think it was their wife's ex-boyfriend came back to their place and then mur like tried to murder him and he almost bled to death and it was it was wild like he had like a shirt on top of his on top of oh what was it on top of this desk and he like pulled it down and then the sugar there was sugar like a bag of sugar on top of that and it soaked his wounds and like apparently sugar super absorbent like it literally saved his life wow. and then I think his wife got murdered but Damn. but he he claims that the answer to pain is within the pain man yeah that, that, i actually like that quote a lot because i mean if, if you just have nothing but light 
everything's perfect there's no way to grow because you don't have anywhere to move forward to so you have to have pain or darkness in order to move forward towards what others would call light or positivity it pushes you it creates change it's an interaction like a chemical interaction it needs something to begin what the final product will become a catalyst it forces you to think it does it and does. it's hard i mean I, I that's coming from somebody it's coming from somebody who agrees with you but simultaneously like it's hard to accept like i i struggle to accept it i also hold a reservation for all my beliefs i try to question everything I mean, I don't always question all, everything I say or think or do. Sometimes I do it just to see what happens or say it just to see what happens and observe the result and try to gain understanding from that and knowing what I can do in the future to better myself or others, mm. which is important because if you can better others, you can better yourself in turn, which uh, happiness is like a candle, or like, 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 you know, like a candle. If you light other candles, the original one won't go out. There's always going to be that happiness. Or I've that never light. thought about it that way. You can light all the candles you want and still keep yours lit. Do you think some candles are unwilling to be lit? Oh, yeah. Some people are very blocked off by belief systems, by just pain. Previous encounters with people who just have shut them down emotionally or mentally. Others just are just locked up, just don't want to feel, don't want to know. Or afraid and fear of course is the biggest darkness that we can experience and if you're afraid to do something you won't do it and you won't see change because you didn't do anything I mean there can still be change in your life but usually through pain because you fear and again attracting negative things through negative output through fear what's your uh, if you if you're going throughout your ordinary life and then I don't I don't accuse you of having an ordinary life if you're going throughout your life mm -hmm. and you identify something as you're fearful of doing like fearful of carrying out do you like do you have any like approach personally to like how you conquer that or well uh, the reason I started in the service industry was because I had really bad uh, social anxiety like any time I would do um, like group presentations or even individual presentations in high school I would get the jitters I would shake from the anxiety like I would kind of have a little spaz attack and I decided I'm just gonna throw myself into the wolf pit I will become desensitized to social anxiety mm. and that's why I serve that's so I can constantly talk to people and better my communication skills and reduce my anxiety in that way. And I've seen a massive change in the seven years I've been in the service industry. Started as a host, moved to serving, which was a good step. More money, of course, but more experience. Experience is the most important part. Mm. As long as I have that experience, I can carry it forward and better myself and better communicate. So I, I just throw myself into it. If I see a, something in my path that I'm afraid of, I will do my best to throw myself into it. There are other times when I'll use caution and be reserved and just won't, maybe not from fear. It might be from anxiety. I still have it, of course. It's not totally gone. It's still there. But it's, uh, it's my catalyst. It's the way I can grow is by using it to push myself. Like, I want to get past this. I want to conquer this. So that's what I do. I try to put myself forward into what I'm experiencing even if it's pain. Absolutely. I agree with that. I agree with that. Just throwing Thank yourself. You. I, I, I like that approach a lot. Identifying what that fear is and instead of letting it control you, mm -hmm. you're like, let's conquer it. Right. You have to like just mount the fear. Just just grab it. And I mean, if, if you can't, learn from it at least. If you fall into that fear or if you don't take the chance, the opportunity that you saw, you're like, oh, maybe I won't do it right or I'm just I'm just scared of this use that as a learning tool for your next experience in that sort of situation if you can I mean not everybody's aware of that kind of self inflection of being able to take their fear and use it as a tool others just let it consume them whole it's kind of sad to see that too which I mean 
you see that a lot, a lot around here with drug addicts and alcoholics and people who are just violent. They don't know how to direct their rage or their, their negative emotions into something else c creative or at least some sort of output. I mean, like you did boxing. I'm sure that helps you de-stress. Like yeah, after a long, hard day, it felt great, I'm sure. Very counterintuitively so. Yeah. Very counterintuitively. I, yeah, it's one of the most relaxing things you can do during and, like, post. And if more people had access to that kind of thing, to that kind of out outlet, they wouldn't be so violent or so addictive or anything of that nomenclature. They would feel better, be a, a better human. I think I think my biggest problem in life right now is boredom. Same. Just being bored. Like, I reach that point a lot. Mm -hmm. And just things getting very repetitive, very lackluster, and... I don't know. I just I, I try to use an antidote of something that I find exciting or challenging or something to kind of like counteract that. That's but I I would say that's my biggest problem in life right now. I but it, it, would you would you argue that fear is almost like related to boredom in some way? Yeah, it it can go hand in hand. Where if you're afraid to make a change out of fear of pain you will stay in a comfortable routine that keeps you from pain. Your fear of pain lets you be bored. I mean, yeah, you're complacent oh. and you might feel safe, but no new experience, no growth. You are stagnant, which honestly, that's where I'm sitting right now. I have a, a cycle I'm kind of in mm -hmm. um, where I haven't really moved forward in a little while. I've kind of been spinning my wheels, so to say. Like, I feel like I'm trying to push forward, but there's not enough motivation there. I mean, I, everybody, a lot of people say they have depression and all that. I can say I have depression and anxiety and this and that, and it keeps me from getting out of the rut. Um, but fear of pain. Everybody has it. Fear of pain, fear of death. It's just about moving past that. And I've tried, you know, throwing myself into things, and there's always pain there with family or with career or anything of that sort. Do you think fear can be used like positively? Because if I feel, I feel like if I have a fear of anything, it's complacency and boredom. Mm -hmm. it can Especially be. complacency, like the idea of like tonight I went to bed. Not any like it, I mean if, if in my in my opinion, if you are not going to bed better than you were the day before, and you can like honestly tell yourself that then you're most likely not the same. You're probably a little bit worse. Right. Yeah, as you stay stagnant, you sort of fall back. You might regress if you had old habits or things like that you might fall into. That's what I feel from my personal experience. Whether that holds true to other people, possibly not. But I mean, you can see that in like um, an addict, a habitual addict, if they have nothing to do, nothing to do with their hands, nothing to put their time into. They'll just go back to their drug of choice or any drug that will make them feel like they're excited or living or make them feel good because they have nothing else to make them feel good. So they do the thing that they've known has made them feel good before, regardless of the outcome. Mm. They just have a short-sightedness on that, which... That's a great example. Which, there's always that argument, is, uh, is addiction a choice or is it a disease? I think it's both. I've never thought about that. I think it starts out as a choice, although there are some that are predispositioned, possibly genetically, to addiction. Say if you have like a line of alcoholics in your bloodline or a line of meth users or heroin users, you might be somewhat predispositioned to that kind of drug use or alcohol use, which if you use it and you get hooked on it, that's more of a physical addiction. Mm -hmm. But if you're off of it and you're not addicted, but you still want to do it, that's that's the addiction, whether that's a choice or a disease. That's that's a really hard question to answer, honestly. Mm. Which other countries treat it as a disease, uh, mostly in Europe. Like if you have multiple infractions on like drug charges and things like that, which a lot of European countries don't act, don't have drugs criminalized. A lot of them have or decriminalized. But if you have mass amounts or if you get in trouble because you're doing these drugs, they'll put you like before a psychiatrist and put you through rehab and all this and that, and they'll treat you as a patient and not a criminal. 
Because when you're criminalized, you feel like no matter what you do, you're going to end up back there because you are always going to be on paper. You're always going to have that lingering over you and you can't get jobs, so you just turn back to drugs. That's what a lot of addicts in this area, unfortunately, do. They can't get out of that rut. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So if it is a disease, if we were to, like, go down the train of thought that it's a disease, do you think that disease could be put towards positive things or at least, like, societally approved things? Because, I mean, if you look at some of the greatest athletes, like, I think Michael Jordan's a really good example of this. Somebody who went crazy with poker after Mm -hmm. or maybe even during his career. I'm not super sure on the specifics of that. But this really addictive personality who is just obsessed, like absolutely obsessed, maybe even the point of addicted. Mm, like an obsessive personality. Yeah. He like, finds something he likes, it gives him that reward. Like, do you think it can be put towards something positive instead of something like drugs? Absolutely, yeah. If, if people are given the right medium to channel their obsessive behavior through. Um, say if somebody's like a really good engineer, but they just you know, love doing drugs, then as long as they're sober and if they enjoy engineering enough and they get a reward, you know, a serotonin release out of that, they mm-hmm. can put themselves into that in better society if they become obsessive with the engineering that is. They have to have some kind of attachment to it that gives them a reward. The uh, Just the, the thoughts of that would be nice if we could actually get people to you know put themselves into that kind of activity to better society instead of just letting them ruin themselves and their bodies and even their 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 family members with drugs because it affects everybody else around them too of course it's like communism it sounds great in theory but realistically you got to find what resonates with every individual Mm -hmm. and then how much are they going to like it on a scale of one to ten because i i know i've had some hobbies where i I don't know, painting, for example, I got into, and I liked it, I'd say, on a scale of, like, three or four. Right. And I, I, well, I really liked it, for, but it wasn't sustainable versus, like, soccer. I still play that. I've been playing that my entire life, and I still play it all the time. Nice. So that's a lot more sustainable, you know? So it's like you got to find that thing that they like an eight or above. Right. And uh, how are you going to find that before – they end up doing another line of coke or whatever it may be and yeah mess themselves up or cracking their egg to the point where they can't do anything else yeah some people just dive into their drugs the point of disabling themselves entirely which i mean i won't specify but i have family members that have uh been drug addicts for well over a decade but are extremely proficient in say like the medical field or wonderful mathematicians just they don't apply themselves due to the lack of the availability of applying themselves they can't just walk into any university or college and pick up a class and just go into it it's super complicated with getting all of the grants and everything getting the funding and of course waiting for school to come around in order to do that they can't just apply themselves to go do that thing course you know emt jobs are very strict if you have charges on your record they won't hire you Mm -hmm. at all so if you've messed up just once with drugs you could screw over your entire career just one time that's all it takes which i mean of course if we decriminalized all drugs that would solve that and we treated them like patients and help cure them then we would have a much more productive society in terms of the addicts Honestly, that, that argument's always resonated with me as well. Mm-hmm. It's about To me, it's about sovereignty of the individual. Agreed. And what they should do and what they can do with their own consciousness. Because mm. you're, you're the master of your own body. I mean, people can try to tell you what to do and try to force you to do things through certain situations, but ultimately you have the decision. You have control of your own life, which... If you lose control, that's it for you. I mean, if you again that can get into addiction, it's that's it. I mean, some I people think have the willpower to pull themselves out, but not everybody. It's got to be hard, and I'm sure some people are capable of pulling themselves out, but maybe their addictive tendencies or addictive personality, mm. or they're very very strongly neuro neurally connected proclivities to take on the world have just 
overtaken their being and their decisions and their thought patterns or whatever it may be to to any action just always goes back towards drugs yeah a lot of those drugs any usually any uppers just burn out your serotonin receptors to the point where it's almost impossible to ever feel happy if you do enough of that drug like it destroys parts of your brain what a scary thought like mdma is Uh it can be good for like short-term use for like uh they're experimenting with it in california for uh, is it antidepressants i think so they're using like uh uh, the cybacillin mushrooms as well and mdma and a few other um hallucinogenics trying to re-alter a person's uh, neural pathways in order to move them through depression or anxiety is a part of therapy. It's experimental, of course. Um, but, of course, that's not widely accepted, so they're, it's kind of iffy. But There's some research backing it. The little yeah. I've read into that, I've seen some... I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm open to the idea. And As I'm also I'm, I'm very anti, uh, you know, consistently taking some form of an opioid on a consistent daily basis in order to counteract your subjective anxiety or depression or whatever it may be yeah too much of anything is too much i mean short-term use yeah it it can do good but if somebody who binges out on that stuff for well over a year two years or three years never be the same and who knows what that might lead into and Mm -hmm. different cravings that they never had before that and different problems right but also could be a, a, a massive boon to their f- possible future self. They had this horrible experience, and they could bounce off of that and become something great. Uh, Robert Downey Jr., as far as I know, he wasn't a drug addict, but he was in jail and all this and that. He started his acting career very late. He bounced off of a criminal record to become one of the highest paid actors. I always heard he was a drug addict as well. I wasn't sure. I wasn't going to say he was because I wasn't totally sure, but if he was... I that's what I've always heard, and it, this is also going off of like, I don't think memes the right word, but you know like pictures online of pretty much like if he can do it, then you can do it. Yeah, it's inspirational stuff. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So we'll just say for hypothetically, he was a drug addict and he bounced off of that and became one of the highest grossing actors of all time. People can do all kinds of stuff from a horrible past, and it doesn't have to be. Get out of here. That doesn't yeah. have to be whenever you're in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s. You can even do stuff in your 50s and 60s. You can become anything just as long as you put your mind to it. I mean, you can't become the moon by any means. But, <laughs> I mean, if you want to be a you know, high-paid engineer or whatever, as long as you're able to get there, you can get there. It, it kind of goes back to, I don't know where I read this, but if another man is doing it, or a woman, if another human being is doing it, then why the fuck can't you? Why not? Right? I mean, you can look at other people and take inspiration from them. Everybody has heroes. Everybody has somebody they look up to or want to be like. Every great person had it as an inspiration no matter what. They didn't start and just be like, oh, I just want to be the greatest of this thing and just became it. They emulated somebody, emulating another person, whether it be their personality, their, their style, if you're talking about sports, or architecture or something like that, you might emulate their techniques and combine it with your own. And you can become more than what they were. Mm. Inspiration is probably the most important thing with reaching your goals. You have to have something that pushes you. Which, of course, negative catalyst causing you to want to get away from that and then inspiration wanting to pull you towards your goal. You've got to push and a pull. In order to get there, you have to want it. Wait, explain the push and the pull again. Well, like a negative catalyst, if you do, you don't want to experience pain, that will push you away. The catalyst pushes you oh. forward, and the inspiration is your goal, and it pulls you towards it. So you have to want your goal while also not wanting to experience the pain that's that you had before. Finding that balance. But yeah, you have to you have to want to not be in pain, basically, which means everybody is going to be in pain regardless. But reaching your goals is what is what pain can play to do it'll lead you to your goals which is a beautiful thing i mean it's even manifested in physical exercise you know Mm -hmm. because the point of pain of like whenever if you're going on a long run or something along those lines and whenever your legs start to burn that's when they're getting stronger that's when they're getting better that's when they're improving because you're challenging them Mm -hmm. 
you're just experiencing the physical manifestation of that pain externalized in your own legs. Right, yeah, you're pushing yourself past your limits. Once you get the lactic acid start building up and all that pain from the lack of oxygen, you keep going. The next time, you'll be able to go farther. Granted, your muscles have healed. (laughs) Of course, you can't just do it right away as soon as you fall down and get right back up. You can't go farther. But, I mean, with the right diets and things like that, you can push your body to the limits. Run multiple marathons if you wanted to, but everybody has their own physical limitations. I feel like that's a little bit more straightforward, though. I think it's a really good, like, almost metaphor for, you know, like subjective pain or pain that you're going through in life or, you know, just the, the human conditioning of suffering mm-hmm. in itself. I, I, that, that one's a little trickier, at least to me it is. Well, I mean, the, the creative human spirit is only creative because it wants to show what it has felt. The, it's, it's dynamic in that it experiences pain and pleasure and that you combine these to make art. Music is mostly heartbreak and all this and that. You're seeing also this in the same album of the same artist, you're going to see things about like beauty and, and nirvana, and then you'll see things about depression and suicide, all from the same artist because they've experienced things like this. So using your pain and your pleasure or your, your, your highs and your lows, you're going to create art. I've never thought about just the creative element that way. Mm-hmm. The creative human spirits in everybody. It's just about accessing, accessing it through your own pain and your your own experience. I, if you have lack of experience, you'll have lack of expression. So you must experience things to express them. If you're a clean slate, you can't make art, or you can't make good art. Rel- you know, relatively speaking, it depends if you think it's good or not, or if somebody else thinks it's good or not. I mean, people sell art with just like cat prints on a big old big canvas and sell it for thousands of dollars just a cat walked across the canvas it's not <laughs> art it's not pain or you know anything like that but it's expression wow wow that's really interesting expression of pain and pleasure mm-hmm. sometimes both sometimes one or the other just everybody has their own own thing with it um what's his name the artist made all the messed up faces you know who I'm talking about? Van Gogh? No. The other one. Um, I remember his is, name. Is it the Screaming Man? You know what I'm talking about? Like the, the sideways kind of doing this? No. Hands on both I cheeks? Think so. I don't know. Wait, I, messed up faces. Like, it has like a mouth here and an eye here and like a hand here. And it's like everything's like rearranged. Oh, was it Picasso? Picasso, thank you. Excuse me. Picasso, yes, he showed, like, through his art that he basically expressed, um, like, schizophrenia and anxiety or, like, internal panic through his art. Like, all of those, that's what, at least that's what I get from it. Art, art usually is interpretation. From what I interpret, I saw that he was showing his anxiety and his pain and his, his just utter horror of realizing his existence is finite and futile and no matter how much he fights against the universe he he will die and he will experience pain no matter what he does and that was just his his outcry was his art his expression of this limited being this limited self this limited form yes and he's almost trying to like not resist it but like fuck yeah he embraced it and just he put it he put it down he's like this is how I feel mortality (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow that's a that's a is that your interpretation or is that like from the piece i'm thinking of yeah wow that's really interesting that's that that is really interesting of course van gogh cut off his own ear to send to his girlfriend to prove that he loved her which i heard it was a prostitute i mean if love is love no matter what they've done <laughs> you can have a horrible past and have a great future if if if, if he sent her his ear and they ended up getting married and having children and all this and that that would have been a great future for him he would have had love and positivity but that's why i don't judge women on promiscuous behavior exactly their i body, love that their choice yeah exactly want. and same with the guy absolutely do whatever you want and if as long as you can change yourself to 
you know, have a better life with whoever you're choosing, then it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter your body count or what you've done or even if you have any STDs or anything. As long as you, you, you prepare properly for that, you're fine. I love that. I love that. Just acceptance of yourself and the other person. Ooh. That's hard. That's hard. That is much easier said than done. It really is. Yeah, my, uh, well, I probably shouldn't mention that. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say something about uh, my significant other, but she probably won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I'm noticing that at this age specifically. Because uh, how old are you exactly? 26. I would have guessed 27. So yeah. I don't know if that's a compliment or a diss. A year I, older. I <laughs> but no, um, so I'm, I'm I'm coming up on 24. I'll be in 24 in like a month. Grandpa. Yeah, I know, right? I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm gonna get you a walker. <laughs> <laughs> the spinners and everything. I, I'm. That's what I'm noticing. It like this age right now is like, it's really, more so a few years ago. But I just don't know if I believe in like like young love. I think it's hard for people. I don't know if it's like a college thing or what it is. But I I think. It's almost like choice paralysis, like the paradox of choice of having so many people to choose from, whether it be online or through like university or through coworkers or just all the people you're constantly meeting. It's so hard for me to, for not me, for generally speaking, people my age to make that choice. So it's, it goes back to acceptance. It's almost, I'm not like cynical of young love, Mm -hmm. but I do have I, I don't know if it's a healthy dose. Ideally, it's a healthy dose, but I have a dose of skepticism for it, sure. It's healthy to hold some reservations about that kind of thing. Because, I mean, if you just fully believe something at face value and it just you fall flat on trying to execute that belief, then obviously you're going to have a stigma against that. Like, oh, yeah, young love is horrible. It's not real, this and that. But to have a small belief while also thinking, oh, it might not be real, that's healthy. Balance is healthy. Which, me, I was lucky enough to find love fairly young. Um, I met my now girlfriend on Tinder. Uh, we were, no way. Yeah, we were originally intending to just be a hookup. We messaged back and forth for a couple weeks. And we met at a Starbucks, you know, a public place that's neutral. And we talked for like six and a half hours on our first date. We just really? Talked, we just talked. Like we were originally going to sit down, chit-chat get comfortable and like oh yeah let's go to my place and do our thing and then we won't talk to each other anymore you know the normal tinder thing Uh uh-huh no it's almost four years later (laughs) we're still together that's insane yep definitely the woman i love wow that was four years ago four years ago yep that is just beautiful i love that i love that do you have any do you have any shame and meeting on tinder i've met so many people dude why the fuck does it matter where the hell you met to me, that doesn't matter. Like, who cares? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. You meet someone in a bar. You meet someone on the side of the street. You meet somebody in prison in Merriam. It, it, it doesn't matter. Wherever wherever you find love is where you find love. It's, it's where your heart's at. Absolutely. And that's what's most important is accepting yourself and that person regardless. Because, I mean, she's been through some stuff. I've been through some stuff. You know, but we accept and love each other regardless of that. So do you think a lot of love in itself, like your theory of love or application of love, do you think it all goes back to acceptance or a big chunk of that? Acceptance, trust, and determination. Like sometimes it's going to be hard. Not every day is flowers and sunshine in a relationship. You're going to have hard days. It's almost like acceptance goes back to the past. Mm -hmm. Trust goes almost... It's present and future. Yeah, yeah, present and future, and then... Uh, what was the other one you said? Uh, determination. Yeah. Determination almost for like a better outcome or a good outcome at carrying into yeah. the future. Directing that trust with determination and intention, of course. Mm. So as long as you can communicate properly with your intention of the relationship, then you can have a healthy and full relationship. Even if you, you know, met having a hookup immediately, like, oh, yeah, this is good, fun, da 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 And then finding out it leads somewhere beautiful somewhere you know full and realized more than just a hookup you could have a whole life with that person you wouldn't even think it was the first time you met him because i mean having a hookup is a it is an initial it has an initial point of trust like i trust you not to lie to me about anything you have or i trust you 
to use protection or I trust you not to hurt me or this and that and set boundaries. So if anything, it's kind of a good way to set up like a, an initial like set of, you know, trust, but not always the healthiest for certain people who have certain personalities. But for myself, my girlfriend now, we didn't hook up on our first date. We talked forever and then talked for a few more days and then actually went on a, a real date date and then and then we had sex of course and then we continued on and have been dating since then wow it was, it was a very quick physical emotional spiritual uh, mental attraction all at one it was like the full package all at once very interesting it was beautiful it was fast it was very fast and exhilarating and wonderful it still is uh, it was just some people just don't see how it could have happened they don't of course don't always believe in young love or love at first sight which so it, it, that that speed mm -hmm. like almost that, that do you think a lot of people kind of discredit how quick things build up like if it's quick to build up and become something beautiful then it's quick to fall as well some people can think that way yeah it's it's do you think it's irrelevant though the amount of time that that intimacy is achieved it can be. I mean, if you burn out fast and you go through all your different stuff really quickly, then you don't let it, excuse me, if you don't let it, like, ride out and do different things as you go along, yeah, you can burn out pretty quick and become bored and complacent with the relationship. But as long as you keep things fresh and discover new things together, that can help keep it alive. That's just, like, of course, in speaking sexually or... Yeah, physically, sexually, sometimes even mentally, just going to experience new things together, like going like meetup groups or going somewhere you've never been before, been before, or just going on a random road trip. Just request a week off and pick a direction, and just drive. I mean, just to go experience together. That can keep things fresh. It, it's it's more about you got to get creative with it. Yeah, it's about your creativity like and your ingenuity in a relationship. If you just do what you've done before in a relationship. You're going to experience what you've experienced before. You have to create new situations, create new new ways of being, new ways of loving in order to find that freshness and spice, as they call it, in a relationship. It's to, it's to become one with your partner, which is a beautiful thing. I'm still striving for it. We're still trying to find new things, which is fun, but tiring sometimes. But important. This is a little bit off topic, or it's taking it back to another topic. That's fine. But I agree with you on this. The legalization of all drugs. So if every drug, like we're talking, let's go, literally everything. everything. Literally everything. I don't everything. even have to name them off. Maybe like illegalizing labs or illegalizing like mass amounts is fine. Because um, in Europe, they don't like have it where it's like government supplied, but you can get smaller amounts that allow you to experience it without being able to binge out for days because you can make it all in your house. Which Interesting. Which means, technically, you still could, of course, making that illegal would be a good middle road because, I mean, if decriminalization is good, uh, but people will still go on binges and, you know, basically kill themselves on drugs. Let's say if, if it was sold like nicotine is today, like cigarettes are. Regulation. That's the most important. Yeah. Okay, so if it's, like, recreational and regulated, then what do you what do you think the result would happen? Like, if it happened tomorrow, all drugs are legal, it's all on the table. Because I, I think there would be some negative backlash at first. But I think, yeah. I think long term it really would be a positive solution. Yeah, because a lot of people, like, will reach out to that world of drugs because it has a stigma of – negativity of like that's bad you should never do this stuff ever rebellion but, yeah but some other people will have that that curiosity people want to experiment people want to feel different forms of consciousness through those drugs so to make them legal makes them accessible and safer because we can provide clean needles or maybe a safe area for people to do these things and like hey you can do any drug you want but you should do them in this place. That might be a better solution than letting them take as much as they want to their house and losing their job because they won't, you know, go to sleep for days or eat or whatever because they've been binging. It's easier to have a controlled area for it or maybe a controlled supply. That would be probably the best route for that. In my, my opinion. Yeah, in regulation. Yeah, in my, my opinion, which I don't think I'm right. I just like to 
hypothesize yeah, on it, kind of yeah, speculate. It kind of take variables into consideration on what could happen if we just let everybody have everything they wanted, which would be wonderful. I mean, it's de- fun to do that with a lot of things. Yeah, like decriminalizing you know? drugs, decriminalizing prostitution, anything like that would make everything safer because it considering could be re- other regulated. I mean, even maybe very comparable to like utopian economic systems or exactly. It's it's fun to pick those things apart because you. Mm. It's like I don't think I'm right, but I think this might be a better alternative, and I might be right. Mm. Or it's not even like it's not even a me thing. Like I may be right. Like this idea might be better in comparison to this this might be a superior way culturally to carry on the world or the rest of humanity yeah and bouncing them off people is a better way to get a reflection off of it and maybe alter your own thinking process or your own thoughts or opinions um have you heard of the venus project is that down in florida no 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 it's just it was this older guy he uh, he had this kind of world utopian view what was his name was he like 101? I don't know. He Dude, I've heard of this. I've heard of the Venus Project. I just yeah. you're gonna you're gonna tell me, and I'm gonna it. Well, it's all gonna come back to me. Men- Sorry for interrupting. Oh, you're fine. It's mentioned in one of the. Uh, there's a series of movies called Zeitgeist, okay. and they're like kind of documentaries on religion. Uh, documents 9/11 and like some of the inconsistencies in the story with that. I've seen the one of religion and and um, I think it's the same one actually, but 9/11 as well. Yeah, that there's the banking system one, but in one of the other ones, it talks about like how to solve the problems that those things have created, and the Venus Project is one of those hypotheses of solving the problem of our society. Basically, he would it wouldn't like enforce permaculture, but it would encourage permaculture. Which is, do you know what permaculture is? No. It's basically where people grow food in their gardens or rooftops on their buildings, and they just share it with everybody. Like, they just give food to those who need it and don't let people who are trying to be greedy accumulate too much So you food. said enforce, not, or encourage, not enforce. Yes, encourage Beautiful. permaculture. Like, give people, like, props or, or, like, rewards in a way of sharing their food. If they have a surplus of food they've grown, to give it away, not selling it. That also gives the individual sovereignty and independence. Exactly, exactly. I, of course, like sharing your livestock, like if you have cows, share the milk. If you kill a chicken, share the chicken. If you have leftover, of course. Everybody sh- you know, should have their own sustainability, in my opinion. Everybody should be taught how to garden, how to at least somewhat run a farm, how to sew and how to cook, how to make clothes, how to fix cars. That should be part of our curriculum, in my opinion, because those are vital skills. And a lot of people might, like the, the, some people might refute that and say, oh, that's too much of an egalitarian communist utopia. I can see that. But like, it's, it's practical. It is. But Why it, not? If you, if you don't Why contribute, not? you won't, you won't receive any benefits. If there's, if say there's a benefit system, say if you shared things and it was documented, excuse me. If you shared things and it, you were rewarded for it, you would receive, say, more uh, more free time off work or maybe a higher pay for your work or something like that. If you were able to do more things for the community, then it would be an incentive to share, an incentive to help those who can't help themselves. People respond to incentives. Yeah. It's and the basic law of economics. And if everybody did that, it would, it would alleviate poverty almost entirely. Now, of course, part of the Venus Project was to eliminate in a monetary system entirely. He was going to replace it with a resource-based economy where every person had their own, they, of course, the sovereignty, as you say, they had their own body to work with. They would be able to work wherever they wanted, granted they had the skills, and contribute to said company or to the government or to the community as a whole. And if they could work and help people, they were, you know, given what they needed. It's like a, like a base income, sort of, but in terms of, like, food and shelter, entertainment, things of that sort. So people, people were, were provided for while not being forced to work or forced to do anything. Mm. Of course, those who don't want to work, um, there's plenty of them. I don't, I don't like working, but I have to. But if they didn't want to work, they would not receive as much. They mm. would get what they needed, but not everything they wanted. So if you get what you want, you have to put more forward. 
of course, part of the Venus Project was eliminating fossil fuels entirely. Using so there's solar. still incentives. Yeah. Still incentives yeah. there. He, want, he wanted to use solar and geothermal and wind power to power everything. Um, he had, like, this little system designed to cover massive, sw- excuse me, massive swaths of different, like, uh, wildlands with uh, the solar pi- panels still were to power everything. So you wouldn't have to burn up all these fossil fuels and create all the greenhouse gases and things like that. So he had this little design plan. There was a few holes. I mean, people have kind of added to it as time went along. I'm pretty sure he died a few years ago, too, about four or five years ago. If it's who I'm thinking of, and I think I've seen the documentary on the Vetus Project, mm-hmm. he was like 101 whenever that documentary came out. When I saw it, he was a pretty old guy. So and it, it didn't might he have be like, the same one. He had like a mi- like he went by like, was it Jack maybe? Or, it, it, I remember three names. Like he went, he had his middle name included in there. I'm not entirely sure. I that's so. I, regardless, if you're thinking of the same thing that I'm thinking of, like that is so cool. And it was a very, it was a very idealistic, utopian thing. But it it was very practical as well. Yeah, uh, he had like concept art drawn up of entire cities just covered in greenery from all the stuff that he was growing. Like all the people were growing food, and mm. all the tram lines were going through and not causing any pollution. They were totally silent. All the stuff that's possible with the technology we have. It's just a matter of application, removing money from the process, and just letting people work for what they want in order to achieve a better society. If you remove money, which is just a value system, I call them freedom credits, in order to... I love that. Yeah. You call money freedom credits. Yeah, I learned that from somebody else, but I've adopted it, of course. That's Can I adopt it from Absolutely. you? Absolutely. That's make, you beautiful. Just give it back when you're done. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, if, if more money you have, the more freedom you can exercise. Even when, when you're super rich, you can exercise your freedom over an entire society and change things. But I love that so much because I've always said that I'm not chasing money. Like, ideally... X amount of years from now, I would like to have a fair amount of money to sit back yeah. on. And it's not that I want the material possessions. Like, since a young kid, I don't have any interest. Like, I, I will probably live in a house half the size of my parents' house, honestly. Right. But what I want is that freedom. I want the freedom to, if I, if I want to take three weeks off work and go do something else, then I can. Right. You know, I want that freedom. Same. I really want that. I want to just be totally free. Free of obligation, but if I wanted to contribute, I could. It'd be nice. Instead of like like that obligation, maybe I want to go do this today, mm-hmm. not I have to go to work today. Yeah, this is very idealistic, and it sounds almost utop- utopian, but it's very very much a pipe dream. I mean, I like the idea of it. Just the practicality of the society we live in, with just money driven greed, would be very hard. It'd be like just like picking a really deep tick you'd have to really dig in and get a full force of people to really just pull out of what we were sucked into which is addiction to money an addiction to oil and addiction to entertainment just just the overproduction of I've always, things i've always thought that i'm like the u.s is one of them i mean we are, we are we the richest country in the world no is that no one of the one of the most wealthy per individual country in the world yeah like per average we have some of the highest base income but we also have some of the highest poverty and some like for first world countries speaking highest poverty and some of the highest um lack of education like illiteracy in a lot of our states um yeah there's there's children dying every day from hunger in our in our in our in our country while people are just throwing away over half their food every meal so it's just a matter of hoarding that money and hoarding that access to good things that help you live and live lavishly even. Um, I mean, I consider myself lower middle class. I mean, it all, it's, all it's going to take is like one bad thing to happen and I'll, I'll be, you know, poverty stricken, which is horribly unfortunate, which a lot of people have already faced that. A lot of homeless people are just people who had one bad thing happen to them that just snowballed into being homeless, jobless, no health care, no car, and suddenly they're stuck on the street with nothing but the clothes. Oh, and wow. And they're just screwed. Because, I mean, it, people are just hoarding everything. And the shitty part is, like, a lot of the time, if you're going to be very wealthy, mm-hmm. what's going to get you there? Sometimes 
some things that are going to get you money and power are narcissism, selfishness, greed. Mm-hmm. And is that kind of is that individual who gets on the other side necessarily going to want to fund the people mm-hmm. that he's so detached from at that point? No, pro- well, I mean, when w- capitalism encourages taking advantage of other people. Like if you can sell them something at a high price that you bought for cheap, you're taking advantage of that person, of that consumer. Because right. we're in a consumerism society, of course. So if you can create a product or a service that you can produce for cheap and sell for high, you're basically taking advantage. And, of course, as you gain more money, you can give w- get away with more uh, immoral practices business-wise, of course. I- it's just... It's just a sick greed that's taken a hold of not just our country, but the whole world. It's just an acclamation of wealth and not worrying about the person, you know, down the road who is worrying about their next meal or hasn't eaten for several days. They're not worried about that person because it's not them. And And the wild part, too, is that person can become the other person. Like that person that was once, Mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, you see it all the time with rappers, you know? Yeah. They, They want to get out of this really bad place like man i got out of the ghetto i got off the streets i got off the streets Mm -hmm. and then the person they became on the other side is they're so detached from that person right that they used to be well there there are some that still like go back and like help communities because they're still you know j cole does that yeah i think ice cube did some stuff too um icp you know the clown posse dude i have a friend who went to an icp concert Dope. a good friend of mine yeah nice see i liked the music when i was like a kid you know like uh, great malenko was the album that i had not just jam the crap out of that yeah it was horribly you know explicit and violent lyrics and all this and that but it was fun to listen to just because it was like kind of a rebellious thing absolutely but they donate so much of their money to kids they were there for katrina and Rita and all kinds of stuff. They were really? donating money and and supplies, food, water, toys to kids. They were there helping. They were for the community all the way. Other people just sit back like, oh man, that just sucks. I mean, I'll I'll throw a little bit of cash their way towards a certain fundraiser or towards a certain you know donation that might not actually go to those people. Red Cross. Uh, really? Yeah, Red really? Cross hoards a lot of money that's donated to them. They don't usually that doesn't usually end up in the hands of the people uh remember the cuba, i was not aware of that that's crazy the uh the cuba uh earthquake what was it 10 years ago eight years ago i'm not familiar haiti i do remember the haitian earthquake absolutely yeah, yeah. haitian cuba yeah they um they were donated so many millions of dollars and they built like three orphanages out of all these millions of dollars they barely did anything with it and everybody kept questioning, where did this money go? Where did this money go? And uh-huh. they didn't have an answer, and it just kind of faded away from the news stories because news is not going to cover that. Mm-hmm. The media is not going to ask, hey, where did all this money go? We donated to you guys. They're just going to let it go. So, I mean, a lot of those big, big you know, charity funds aren't always helping people. They're usually hoarding it for themselves. I definitely stay skeptical if I was going to donate anything, but mm. that's ridiculous. Like uh, donating hair. Uh, you've heard of Locks of Love, right? Mm-hmm. Locks of Love sells those wigs that are made from your hair for hundreds of dollars to these kids who are cash- cancer patients and stuff like that. If you donate to Locks of Love, they donate the wigs for free to the kids. So being aware of your options. So Locks of Love versus what was the other option? Um, I've already forgotten. <laughs> Locks of Love versus... But Locks of Love actually does donate. Yeah. Okay. That's the one I've heard of. That's the one I've heard of is Locks of Love because my sisters did it years back. Sorry. Backwards. Locks of Love charges. Oh. Yeah. It's wigs for kids that donates. Interesting. Really? Yeah. Wigs for kids. Wigs for kids. That's right. And at least in my little perception of reality, Locks of Love is like the brand name. So why not go with what you're familiar with? It's that's, like that's what they go with. This yeah. is what my sisters went with, and that's the most familiar to me. So they must be doing a good thing. Mm-hmm. It passed somebody else's approval, therefore, it's probably gonna work out. Exactly. And wigs for kids isn't as well known because they don't they don't have as much money because they aren't charging for these wigs, but they're doing more for the kids. I mean, that possible. little perception of how it appeared to my sisters first is. 
possibly because of a marketing ploy or something, you know, because yeah. they had the resources. Which when I tell people that, they're like really surprised. Like, I didn't even know there was another option when I donated my hair. They didn't mention that. Of course they don't. Because sometimes those places will get a little bit of bonus if they can donate so much hair. They've made it into a business. Everything is monetized. Oh, yeah. It's, dude. Money's the biggest Somet problem. Money in politics, money in corporations, money in donations, money in welfare programs. You're totally right, though. It's like all problem. It, it really is. It's the, um, I don't know, it's beautiful in a lot of ways, but it does re it reward selfishness. It really does. It, capitalism, it, it produces so much poverty because there has to be a, a duality, the poor and the rich. There's some in between, of course but it's going to produce both ends of the spectrum at the Do same time. Do you think time. that's intentional? Do you ever think of that from like an elitist point of view? Oh, yeah, yeah, because there's only 500 certain like corporate executives and government officials, high-end. There's only 500 of them that own over half of the entire country's wealth, which amasses to $500 trillion in offshore accounts and things like that. So the rest of the wealth is being dispersed between 200 99 million nine hundred ninety five thousand five hundred people why did they need that it's just greed corporate greed they've amassed so much they've reached the very top of the pyramid so to say and they don't see the need to give to it because there's still so many people alive of course they use uh, the the reason for overpopulation if they just gave away so much of their money people would be so well off they'd reproduce so fast we couldn't keep up with the food production there would be not enough housing, no room. We have to destroy more forests to create more houses, to create more farmlands. They, they use these environmentalists, which I do advocate for the environment, but they use this to twist it in a way to hoard their money. Mm. So, so they use like the counter arguments of more people creates more... More strain on the environment. Mm. So, I mean, there's it's a kind of a two-sided coin. I mean, y you want to help the environment by not using as much trash or donating or, or recycling and things like that. But at the same time, if if you want to reproduce, you're going to you know add another person that's also going to consume those things. Even if they recycle, there's still some consumption there. Whether you're consuming gas to get around to your job or if you're, you're buying things at the store that still consume plastic, that plastic still has to be made. There's still a demand for that plastic. To My be made. question is, if they have all this money, what are they putting it towards you think hoarding it just letting it sit you think so yeah i mean if they were spending it we would see a trickle down but we don't there's not enough trickle down that's the whole thing with capitalism is how it's supposed to work was that they were supposed to make a lot of money the ceos and all this and they were supposed to spend it on like public works projects they're like hey let's just build a whole bunch of schools or i'll build a whole bunch of hospitals and we'll pay all these construction workers and hire a bunch of doctors and all this and that but there's not enough of that so there's doctors who are unemployed because they can't find work or teachers who can't find a school to teach at or things of that sort because there isn't enough being trickled down to the common person. It's, ju it's just greed. It just boils down to greed, which is sad. I wonder if they see it that way. Or I, I'm curious, what they're, one, if they're, what they're spending it on because they clearly have <laughs> too much. That's that's ridiculous. I mean, you said five hundred trillion divided by five hundred people. I believe that's the number. So the average, obviously, would come out to a trillion per person. About. So these are technically the richest people in the world. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, Jeff Bezos. Mm. I mean, what is he even? Uh, and what's his name? Uh, something Branson. He what's your Branson? Yeah, he he has billions of dollars, billions upon billions upon billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. So he's among the top echelon mm. of richest men in the world i do i like richard branson though at yeah, least like the few podcasts i've listened to him with like he's Didn't he, he seems a like a good guy or something like that a while back ah, i wouldn't be familiar with back that in the early 2000s i remember seeing like him like in a hot air balloon and it was like some extreme show that had to climb from the top of the air balloon down and that's probably right because he actually he i think he broke some world's record he was the first person to cross one of the oceans in a hot air balloon nice it's pretty impressive, actually. Which hot air balloons are slow as hell. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Can we take a bathroom break? Is that yeah, right? absolutely. Sweet. Well, how long are we even going? Hour and thirty minutes. Do you do you just want to call this quits? I'm I'm down for whatever, bro. 
Cool, I'm down with whatever too. Well, I'm gonna. Put I'm I'm down to I'm down to call us quits, as much as I'm enjoying the conversation, because mm-hmm. I gotta piss as well, and then I usually go about an hour to two hours. So. So that's probably a good spot. Absolutely. Is it right around the corner? Uh no, I'll walk you up there. Right. Thanks for coming on. Oh,